This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our conversation with the world-renowned filmmaker Raoul Peck, who is releasing a film today in Los Angeles and New York on the life and times of Karl Marx, it's called The Young Karl Marx. Raoul Peck is an acclaimed Haitian filmmaker, a political activist. His documentary, I Am Not Your Negro, has just won the top documentary prize at the British Academy Film Awards, or BAFTA, on Sunday. It was nominated for an Oscar last year. His previous films include Lumumba, Death of a Prophet, Haiti, The Silence of the Dogs, and Sometimes in April about the Rwandan genocide. Raoul Peck also briefly served as Haiti's Minister of Culture in the 1990s. It's great to have you back to continue this conversation. Thank you. Um, I want to play one more time um, Wayne LaPierre. We played this in the first part of the conversation. He's head of the National Rifle Association. Um, you have his comments attacking the student-led movement for gun control after the Parkland massacre, where a young man trained by the military and the NRA, 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz, um, has been charged with murdering 17 people, 14 of them students, three teachers and coaches, as he went into his alma mater, his old school, and gunned people down. It wasn't a week before the head of the NRA, one of the most powerful lobbying institutions in the United States, um, has broken their silence and has gone after those who want to do something about gun control. This is Wayne LaPierre. On college campuses, a communist manifesto is one of the most frequently assigned texts. Karl Marx is the most assigned economist. And there are now over 100 chapters of young democratic socialists of America at many universities, and students are even earning academic credit for promoting socialist causes. In too many classrooms all over the United States, and I know you think about this when you decide where you're going to kid send your kids to school, and your kids think about it too, the United States Constitution is ignored, the United States history is perverted, and the Second Amendment, freedom in this country, is despised. So that's Wayne LaPierre. Um, you have chosen to look at the Communist Manifesto, Raoul Peck, to look at the life of Karl Marx, um, uh, and talk about its significance in shaping history of the world. Uh, Wednesday marked the 170th anniversary of the publication of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels' seminal text, The Communist Manifesto. May 5th marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of Karl Marx. Um, is Wayne LaPierre right that all over the United States people are learning the Communist Manifesto? Mm -hmm. Well, what I would say first is to try to take a little bit distance to this actuality going on right now. In fact, if we lose too much time trying to decipher what this man just said in this clip, you know, we, that's how they get us. You know, they set up the agenda, and usually an agenda full of ignorance. Because half of what he said is, is the result of total ignorance. Uh, the same way, unfortunately, the president is totally ignorant on a majority of subjects. And so we lost that battle, that what I call the rhetorical battle, uh, because they, it's easy for them to just say a lie uh, or say a, 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 a totally ignorant uh, comment. And then we usually try to uh, uh, deconstruct that comment, and but you usually don't have the time to do that. So uh, I will not go or, or uh, go into whatever he said, which is totally uh, ignorance. And why I choose to tell that story of the young Karl Marx, young Engels, and young uh, uh, Janie Marx is is the beginning of it all. It's the beginning of uh, the uh, alienation that goes with capitalism. Capital is at center of capital is, is the making of profit. And there is nothing wrong to produce merchandise, but there is something wrong when your production is just gain, uh, is just toward uh, profit. Marx called that the, uh, um, uh, the, not the alienation, but the, you know, that you follow profit as, as uh, an only goal. 
you know. And at the, at the stage where it doesn't matter what damage it does to a community, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, like in the case of Florida, you know, young people were killed. And you still go on TV or uh, in front of the press and saying, we don't care, what is important is still being able to sell guns and to make money and make profit. This is the total fetishization, I was looking for the term, of profit, you know, where you don't even know why you want to make so much money. And, and so it's important to come back to Marx, who did analyze that particular historical society which is the capitalist society, uh, which now have gone global. I want to go back to the trailer of the young Karl Marx. How do you do? Nice to meet you. Zunela owns foundries. He employs many workers, including children. Child labor in factories. But we've no choice. Without child labor, we price ourselves out of the market. And where would a society without exploitation lead people like you? You would have to work too. Wouldn't that be horrible? We must fight the establishment. Soon, the old world will crumble. There are two kinds of men that have been forged by manual labor. Men who profit from the fruits of that labor. This has got to stop. It's intolerable. Count yourselves lucky I don't sack the lot of you. I hate and despise gentlemen. They are swine who grow fat on the sweat of laborers. We're fed for the scrap heap. Is that what you're saying? You heard it. Get out. They can try to stop us, but they cannot stop our minds. A few nights in jail will do us some good. Gentlemen, I'm all yours. Karl, darf ich vorstellen? Friedrich Engels. Haben Sie meine Texte gelesen? Ich habe Ihre. Have you read my work? I've read yours. You're the greatest thinker of our times. Happiness requires rebellion. Everything can change. Nothing lasts forever will overthrow the old order. It's time to wake up. Until now, philosophers interpreted the world, but it must be transformed. The bourgeois and the workers, are they brothers? No, they are not. They are enemies. To free minds and free spirits. By the order of the Prime Minister, you're expelled from France. What name stirs in the veins of such inspired writing? Karl Marx. The trailer for the young Karl Marx that is just being released in the United States, in Los Angeles and New York. Again, a film that is set in the factories and ferment of Paris, of Brussels, Prussia, England of the 1840s. But um, people don't actually, unlike what Wayne LaPierre said, learn very much about Karl Marx in the United States in, in classes. For good reasons, yes. Tell us his story. Well, basically, uh, Karl Marx come from a very uh, long tradition of rabbis. Uh, his father um, had to convert it to Christianity, because at the time in Germany, uh, to get some certain job, you couldn't be Jewish. Uh, and he, very early on in his life, he was revolted. Because don't forget, it was a Europe of repression, it was a, re a Europe of uh, censorship. Uh, most uh, kings and queens in Europe were family, and they they got together to keep the the the, the whole continent under their their power. And we're talking about the mid 19th century. Yes, exactly. And you know there was a time where y you had famine in Ireland. You know that's why you know when this country America, uh, you know refugees came. They were trying to find a new life, because they were dying by the hundred thousands. So in this time, you see those people who come from middle class, Engels come even from a very rich family, industrial family. Uh, Engels' uh, uh, father had factory in Germany and factory in Manchester. Manchester was the really the city where capitalism really developed. The first uh, mill, the first textile, textile uh, 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 factories, and also exploitation. You know, in that same city, 
they were producing incredible amount of wealth. And at the same time, uh, Manchester was like a slum in Brazil or in Haiti. Uh, people were barefoot, men, women, children, in winter, in that same city that was, you know, the center of wealth uh, in, in the uh, 19th century. Eight, uh, yes, 19th century. So, uh, and those young people, they start documenting that, and they start working on that uh, to explain, you know, this is not the way uh, we should continue to live. And they start organizing, and they start, uh, um, more importantly, to research that. You know, Marx spent a lot of time in, in the, in the uh, libraries, you know, reading every economist that existed, re reading every philosopher that existed. Uh, his teacher uh, said of Marx, when he was 19, he had his PhD at 19. Uh, the, the man was a genius. His teacher said, well, if you want to meet Diderot, Voltaire, uh, Hegel uh, <laughs> in one man, you should meet that, that young man. So it's an incredible story of, of coming of age, adult age, of three young people in the Europe of 19th century. So talk about how Karl Marx meets Frederick Engels. Well, uh, when Karl Marx had to leave uh, Germany and go into exile to Paris uh, to start a new uh, newspaper, uh, and uh, because he believed in education, he believed in, you know, it's not about putting people in the street to protest, it's first about educating them. You know, why are they fighting for, and what are they fighting for, and in what kind of society they are. And, uh, and Engels used to send article to that uh, same magazine, and one day he came to Paris and they met. And it was the beginning of a long story, but they stayed ten full days, uh, drinking, laughing, playing uh, chess, uh, writing, and, and uh, making projects. And Engels, that's the, beginning the son of an industrialist, of industrial, a factory yes. owner. And, and Marx was in Paris already married. He was a uh, young, uh, newlywed, and they just had their first child, uh, Jenny Chen, uh, a young girl. And, and they became inseparable. And they, I think each one recognized in the other uh, the role they could play together. So set up this clip for us. Um, this is from the young Karl Marx, and this is a scene between Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, and Marx's wife, Jenny, um, who is—they're uh, coming up with a title for the book that would later be The Communist Manifesto. Yeah, and the scene before is that they spend the whole night drinking, discussing, and coming late at home. And, of course, Jenny had to take care of the baby, as it usually is. And, and in the morning, she cannot really curse them, but at the same time, she's making fun uh, uh, at them a little bit. And that's, that's the scene, uh, the breakfast scene in, in Jenny's kitchen. This is a scene from the young Karl Marx. You're leaving already? Thank you for your hospitality. Your generosity. Matters to see to. Matters of the heart. Don't forget our matter. How could I? We didn't just drink last night. We took notes. We're going to write a book together. A critique of Stirner, Bauer, those sentimental Berlin socialists, the writers of the so-called critical critique, will bring things to a head, Jenny. To a head? Monsieur. Sir? Et le titre? And the title? We're just starting. I imagine a title looking at you both. Critique de la critique critique? Critique of critical critique. <laughs> That's a scene from the young Karl Marx, where Jenny Marx recommends, okay, the title of the book should be Critique of Critical Critique. Critique. Talk about this, what it meant when this book was published. Where were they? Well, we are 1848, and at that time, Engels and Marx were summoned by the League of the Just, which was uh, one of the biggest 
uh, organization of artisan. Because at the time, you know, what we call today the working class did not really exist and was not really organized. Uh, the, the people who were organized were the artisan, you know, the tailor, the wood worker, and all those guys who, you know, were their own, uh, you know, their own bosses. And they were the revolutionary of the time. But the, work, the workers, they were, like, treated like animals. So, uh, at the beginning of this, the Ligue des Justes uh, started to shift, and Marx and Engels uh, were, like, young people, uh, you know, uh, starting that uh, to, to work with them, and they asked them, you know, we need a book that will explain to our followers what is, uh, what is the fight we are, we are making and having. And so they, they had to write it in a form that any workers could understand it. And they finish, uh, and that's the end of the film, where they write that uh, famous Communist Manifesto, which became the most read book in the whole history of humankind, by the way, still today. Yesterday, it was the 117th anniversary of this particular book. And uh, so they were uh, um, in—, in uh, Right in 1848, there was, right after that, a revolution. Uh, of course, the book was so new, nobody had ever read it. But uh, historically, people think that the manifesto created the revolution in 48, which was almost in every country in Europe at the time, from France to Belgium to Italy to Germany. And it was the first big revolution, and we can say, of workers uh, rebelling against the, 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 the powers. And, but it wasn't until, you know, the beginning of the 20th century that the book, the manifesto, became really well read everywhere. Because it's, it's basically the description of what is capitalism and what is it, it is causing and, and what is at its center, meaning uh, the, the curse to, to, for profit. You know, and Marx and Engels even describe what we have today, how that capitalism has no limit, and it will invade the whole world, and it will continue until something happens and, and make it explode. But uh, you can read the whole sh first chapter of this manifesto and, and really have a description of what's going on today with globalization. With change, you rarely see the grassroots mechanism that caused the change. And I wanted to yeah. turn to another clip from the young Karl Marx. Uh, this is uh, the meeting, the meeting of the League, the League of the Just. Well, you set it up, Raoul Peck. Well, I, I think it's the meeting, the first meeting that Mary Burns, uh, uh, Engels' uh, working-class girlfriend, managed to get them, because those guys, they were really in hiding. They, in fact, their activities were hidden be behind cultural activity, because at the same, they were uh, looked after by the police, etc. Uh -huh. So Mary Marx was thrown out of France. Uh, who? Marx. Uh, well, yes, he, they were, he was expelled uh, at one point because he wrote another article that uh, the German and the French didn't like, and the German asked the French to expel him, so he went to Belgium. So, uh, in that particular scene, uh, take place in Manchester, where uh, Marx and Engels went there to meet the leader of the, the, uh, the League of the Just, which was the biggest organization, and they knew if they want to organize, they didn't want to start from scratch. They knew that they had to enter whatever the big organization was and try to change it from the inside. And the scene is the first meeting with the head of the League of, of Judges. Let's go to that clip. Uh, here are the men. Friedrich, you've seen before. And this is Karl. Karl Marx. For the League's purposes, there are two kinds of men, men who have been hardened and forged by manual labor, and men who profit from the fruits of that labor, the bourgeoisie. Have a look at you, lads. You're not in the first group. I described in my book. You describe from the outside, not from experience. Have you experienced poverty, prison, persecution? Excuse me, but 
If you rule us out before we've even said a word, what is the point of your motto, all men are brothers? It's an ideal, our ideal. It's what we're fighting for. It's our new Jerusalem. God, what are we doing here? The League needs real men, not eckheads, trying to tell it what to do and think. Yes, but you want to spread your ideas, don't you? So test us. And throw us out if you think we're not useful. Did someone say it useful? Marx? I knew you'd been expelled from France, too. Here you are. Yeah, I'm in Brussels for now. I'm giving talks there this autumn. A step on this long road leading to our one goal, the abolition of money. Let me look at you. You're thinner. You've suffered. Me too. I was shackled and beaten. Look what they did to me. But they couldn't break my soul. That is a clip from the young Karl Marx that has just been released in the United States, now showing in New York and Los Angeles. So, in that scene, uh, you have the speaker, who you can identify, uh, who talks about the League's purposes, talking about there are these two kinds of men, yes. um, those harmed and forged by manual labor and men who profit from the fruit of that well, labor. Well, the film is a film also about the evolution of ideas. And it was important for me to, to show that uh, there, there wasn't just one movement. There were many thinkers, many uh, 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 leaders who were fighting for the same cause, but who had different position. And, and in the film, you see what Marx is bringing, because Marx was bringing a, a more scientific socialism. But you had, on one side, the more populist uh, uh, um, uh, socialists like Weitling, you know. Weitling didn't care about who would make the change. He, he, w he said at one point he would even use uh, criminals, you know, put them in the street to topple the government. And uh, on the other side, you had Proudhon, who was a more uh, what Marx called utopist uh, socialist. And Marx was, no, uh, for, you know, we need to analyze what is really happening. You, we need to uh, understand what are the structure of that particular system. And that's why he called it scientific socialism. So in the film, I had to find a way to at least explain those three different directions, which we can still today uh, see, you know, we would put Bernie Sanders more into a, a more populist, uh, although it's not the same populist as, as Trump. You know, I, I prefer a hundred times more the populist of Bernie Sanders. But those um, categories still exist uh, some way in, in all the movement worldwide. So you talk about these two men and the influence of them on your life. And I wanted to segue right now into the previous film you made, um, uh, a most remarkable, one of the most doc a most amazing documentaries I have never—I have ever seen. Wait, I want to say that again. I've never seen. Um, um, uh, you talk about Karl Marx and James Baldwin, your, which your previous film was about, for which, just on Sunday, you won the BAFTA, and congratulations for that, the British uh, Oscars for I Am Not Your Negro, a stunning film um, about James Baldwin. Talk about Karl Marx and James Baldwin. Well, um, as I say before, they were important mentor to me somehow. They they teach me, they taught me how to think, how to analyze, how to take sometimes distance to you know the day by day occurrence uh, and in politics as well. And uh, and for me, they they were uh, important and are still important because, as well as Baldwin, when you read uh, those lines I use in the film. You know, he wrote like 40 years ago, and you felt he was talking about what was happening in this country today. And the same with Marx, you know, you can, you know, uh, what they wrote in, in the 19th uh, century about how that capitalism was functioning, the type of blindness uh, or, or mystification that is around making profit, you know. 
you know, how can money be at the center of your life? You know, and money not, you know, to earn a living is, is uh, normal for everybody. We, we need money to, to, to live. But to make profit over profit over profit with no other justification than the accumulation of capital. You know, when you look today's, uh, uh, you know, the, the little group of billionaires, you know, what can somebody do with 100 billion on his bank account? What, what sense does it make? And you could say, well, he have 100 billions and he can go home and stay home. No, he want more. You know, he will close down a, a, a factory, uh, you know, and putting 5,000 people in the streets just to get a 0.1 point in, uh, on the, on, in Wall Street, you know. So that means important decision uh, to the life of people are taken for this blind God that profit is. And that's the same to come back to the IRA debate. You know, they don't care how many people will die because they will stick to the fact that we need to make more profit. That's all that counts. And Marx totally deconstruct that, that, that thing that they, they have been building century after century. Mm -hmm. um, that fact, that figure that the uh, world's eight richest men control as much wealth as the poorest half of humanity. We're talking three and a half billion people. Yes. Eight men, three and a half billion people. Yes, and, and that's where, if you take those numbers, it doesn't make sense. And that's, that's the, the thing, that where, where we are today, it took um, a sort of acceleration that nobody's controlling. It's like a, a huge train wreck that is going down the drain, and people are just watching, you know, and, it, it's, and it's terrible, you know. I want to go to the trailer for I Am Not Your Negro. If any white man in the world says, give me liberty or give me death, the entire white world applauds. When a black man says exactly the same thing, he is judged a criminal and treated like one, and everything possible is done to make an example of this bad nigger so there won't be any more like him. I the story of the Negro in America is the story of America. It is not a pretty story. I'm a black man in a white world. Most of the white Americans I've ever encountered surely have nothing whatever against Negroes. That's really not the question. Really a kind of apathy and ignorance. You don't know what's happening on the other side of the world because you don't want to know. In America, I was free only in battle, never free to rest. We need to take action, any kind of action, by any means necessary. They need us to speak to cotton. And now they don't need us anymore. Now they don't need us, they're gonna kill us all off. There are days when you wonder what your role is in this country and what your future is in it. I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. The question you've got to ask yourself, the white population of this country has got to ask itself, is why it was necessary to have a nigger in the first place. Because I'm not a nigger. I'm a man. But if you think I'm a nigger, it means you need it. And you got to find out why. And the future of the country depends on that. That's the trailer for I Am Not Your Negro. As you come to the United States, uh, Raoul Peck, um, Talk about James Baldwin. Um, I, we see a clip also of Malcolm X. We just passed the 53rd anniversary yeah. of his assassination on yeah. February 21st, 1965, and what he means for today. Well, I, I, as I was watching the, the clip again, uh, I was thinking that both these men were, in fact, uh, educators. You know, because their work was always to help us understand what's going on. And today, more than ever, those words are important. Because what has happened is an acceleration of everything, through the internet, through the press, through everything. Young people today are bombarded 
with information, images, sound. Uh, even today we have the terms fake news. Uh, so how do you take some distance to realize that maybe not only uh, you, or instead of being just a consumer, you can also be an actor. And again, to come back to those young children in Florida, this is what they are doing. They are becoming actors. And that's highly important. And they understand, even if they didn't read Marx or didn't uh, open a Baldwin book, what they understood is the relationship between an organization like the NRA, uh, the killing in their schools, for, from a young man who could buy a gun, who have access to that gun, and then also to people building those guns and selling them. And they understood that the only thing in the middle that prevent big change is that they still want to sell guns. And they are ready to say anything they can to prevent a real discussion about that. You know, I mean, I hardly can follow any discussion with some of those guys, you know, they always have a last excuse to explain why they cannot do something. So there is, and, and you can't indulge in that discussion because you have to reduce it to, to what it is. It is about how can I still make more profit, no matter what happened, you know. And both Marx and Baldwin are people who try to tell us, you know, take a step back and try to understand the whole system, how it functioned. And those two films, for me, it's a way to tell young people in particular, go and take a book and read and try to understand your world. Because without understanding it, understanding it you can't fight. I think about James Baldwin speaking after the Birmingham bombing of, what, September 15, 1963, when the four little girls yes. died, the rage of James Baldwin, and how he went from the United States to try to escape the racism of this country and lived in France, where you live yes, now, Raul. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, uh, it's—, it's uh, Baldwin, in fact, understood his country when he left it. Because what he says, you know, he was totally under pressure all the time because he was afraid for, to lose his life. You know, he was uh, 19, 20, and he knew, uh, living in Harlem, working in a village, and he knew that he would either die because, uh, you know, a police would control him. Uh, he was abused by a policeman when he was 12. Uh, so it was his daily life to watch out not to be abused again. And he also knew that one day he might react with anger and get killed for that and get shot. So he decided he needed, because he wanted to be a writer, he, de he decided to leave France and uh, to leave to France. And Paris at the time was a, a sort of a home, a sort of bohemian home for many uh, black American writers, musicians, uh, artists. And so uh, Richard Wright was in Paris. So there, there was a group of people who could, you know, uh, help him, and, and the distance was necessary for him to, to regain uh, his, you know, who he was, you know, that he was not just a victim, but he was a human being. He wanted to be an artist. He wanted to be a writer. So sometimes leaving your country is the best way to understand it better. And, and that's why. And then when he returned to take part in the civil rights movement, he had the necessary ammunition uh, for its fight. We're talking to the world-renowned filmmaker Raoul Peck. His latest film is just out, hitting the silver screen in New York and Los Angeles. It's called The Young Karl Marx. Just won a BAFTA, the equivalent of the American Oscars in Britain, uh, for I Am Not Your Negro, about James Baldwin. James Baldwin, Karl Marx, seminal influences, teachers for Raoul and for so many. But I wanted to go to current politics and get your response. Um, as a, uh, not only a filmmaker, but as a Haitian activist um, uh, who lives now in Paris. Um, about and, and in Haiti and in the U.S. as well. <laughs> <laughs> about President Trump's comments calling Africa, Salvador, your country, Haiti, s whole countries. Um, uh, that first part of whole rhymes with hit. Um, and your response when you heard this? 
Well, my reaction was, first of all, I was not surprised by that type of comment. I mean, if you're old enough, you have heard similar comment from uh, this particular man. Uh, so I'm at a stage where my concern is uh, all the people who are in this administration, uh, all some of them very decent people, uh, the Republican leadership, you know, how far are they willing to go to preserve their <coughs> interests? Uh, because that's the real question, because it's not one man that, um, you know, uh, engage in some reckless declaration. It's uh, the most important part of it are the enabler, the people who should know better, the senators, the representatives uh, uh, in Congress, uh, because they are accomplices. That's how I see it. You know, the, the same way Baldwin say, if you don't speak up against racism, you're not only uh, an accomplice, but you're a criminal. And I'm seeing more and more criminal in this country who have been elected, who are officials, and they are tolerating that for partisan reason. That's unacceptable. What is the model you're giving to, to your youth? You know, and that is my concern. You know, whatever the, the president say, it's today it's unimportant. You know, we, he's capable to say one thing and the next day the contrary. But specifically, uh, what he was reported yeah. to have said, why do we want all these people from Africa here? They're lawmakers. Well, he says um, they're s-hole countries. We should have more people from Norway, he said, and talked about people going you, back that, to their countries. Yeah, that's a proof of profound ignorance. He doesn't know that Haiti was the first free country in the Americas, that it was thanks to Haiti who stopped the army of Napoleon and create a new nation that the French had to sell one third of America, the central third from New Orleans up to the uh, Big Lake. They had to sell it for little money because the Haitian have beaten them up. So if Haiti you don't even born know of a that, slave uprising, the only country the in only, the world uh, in history, yes, and it thanks to Haiti that the whole Latin American continent was liberated. Because in the Haitian con constitution, anybody who set foot, any fugitive who set foot on the island became a Haitian and had support from the Haitian uh, 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 leadership. And Simon Bolivar, who liberated the whole Latin American continent, he came to Haiti. And Haiti gave him weapons, ammunition, merchandise, uh, ship, and soldiers. And isn't it true that Congress wouldn't recognize the independent country of Haiti for so many decades because they were afraid that that slave uprising would inspire the people who were enslaved in the, the United States? The United States. States took 65 years to recognize Haiti independence. Haiti was the only co black country in the whole world with Ethiopia, you know, and we were the bad example. All the superpowers still had slavery. So it was impossible for them to accept that. You know, Haiti was the equivalent of Cuba in the 50s. Well, know. President Trump may uh, change his comments on different countries. Clearly, in the case of Haiti, he's not. Referring to it as an asshole country and then uh, talking about policy. The Trump administration announcing it'll revoke a special immigration program for nearly 60,000 Haitians, including many who came to the U.S. after the devastating earthquake of 2010. Um, Trump administration now saying their temporary protected status, or TPS, will end in July of 2019. I just wanted to play a clip of Marlene Bastien, who uh, is the director of Haitian Women of Miami, speaking on Democracy Now! last year. It is in the best interest, the national interest of the U.S. for the 50,000-plus Haitians to remain here, continue to contribute socially, financially, and otherwise, and then keep these remittances flowing so that people will not risk their lives to come here as a result of these, uh, you know, waves of deportation. So that was uh, Marlene Bastien of uh, yeah. Haitian Women of Miami. Uh, but the significance of now sending tens of thousands of Haitians back. Well, that's irresponsible. And, and again, it's a lot of ignorance. Uh, when they are putting, uh, you know, um, in front, like, well, we are sending back criminals. But this has been going on for 30, 40 years, sending people who have been in prison, sometimes not because they've killed anybody, but because they, they did, you know, have a 
traffic uh, uh, accident, uh, and they are sending them back to countries who are incapable to uh, to solve those new arrival. And it continues up to today, after the earthquake, that, uh, you know, sending back more than 60,000 people, which I think it's impossible to do, by the way, but it's about uh, putting terror on the life of those people who have been living here for so many years, because that's the consequence of that. You know, it's like a lottery. You don't know when you, you are going to throw in a bus and send back uh, to a country you hardly know sometimes. So it's, it's, I, I see it as, as not only as a Haitian problem, but a, a problem of this administration, who think that the solution is to build walls, is to uh, designate, you know, they are the culprit of every problem in this country, when it's the contrary. Those people are helping the, this country being uh, the great country it has been. And then the latest news that is rocking Haiti, uh, the sexual abuse scandal of Oxfam. Um, so, Haiti has suspended Oxfam Great Britain's operations as it investigates claims of sex crimes by senior aid workers in Haiti after the devastating 2010 earthquake. Oxfam's been hit with dozens more misconduct allegations involving a slew of countries in the days since The Times of London broke the story. On Tuesday, Oxfam's leadership was questioned by British law makers and apologize for its failure to report sexual misconduct to Haitian authorities, prostitution illegal in Haiti, but Oxfam refused to report the activity of its aid workers to Haitian police. This is the British Parliament's International Development Committee questioning Oxfam's chief executive, Mark Goldring. Prostitution is illegal in Haiti. Shouldn't Oxfam have reported the matter anyway? Oxfam should have reported the matter to the Haitian authorities. It wasn't for Oxfam to decide whether a crime had been committed or not, but something that was serious and undermined the rule of law and public confidence in Haiti should have been reported to the relevant Haitian authorities. I, make, I can only apologize that Oxfam did not do that. On Monday, Oxfam released its own internal report into the sex scandal, concluding senior aid workers at Oxfam, including the country director in Haiti, hired prostitutes at Oxfam properties in Haiti, then tried to cover it up. Um, and then you have Goldring, who we just saw um, when doing an interview with The Guardian, uh, saying it's not as if we murdered babies in their cots, and then he later apologized for that. Yeah, well, that's unfortunate, but I I'm afraid that uh, we are mixing a lot of things together, uh, and, and I'm not sure it's the right way to go. I spent two and a half years of my life making a documentary about the way humanitarian organization, the way uh, um, countries, including the United States, France, Canada, are doing business in Haiti, about the role of the UN in Haitian politics about the role of Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, in the politics of Haiti. Uh, and the film uh, came out and did not have—because it was not juicy enough. But uh, I recommend people, because this whole story, including the cholera epidemic— uh, Cholera epidemic brought in by, by UN, UN forces. Et cetera. And until today, the UN, although they recognize that their responsibility, refuse uh, to uh, ref uh, do reparation to the more than uh, 1,000 people who died and their families who are still suffering from it. Uh, so, uh, I did two films, by the way. I did one called Fatal Assistance, the title said it all, mm. and another one called Murder in Paco. One is a documentary, the other one uh, is a narrative. And by the way, both touches to that very uh, specific context, including the sexual uh, 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 exploitation of, of young Haitians. Is Haiti still paying reparations to France for becoming independent? <laughs> no, but that could have been, because it Haiti did... paid uh, from basically uh, the start, 18, uh, I would say the, the agreement came uh, 1832, until after Second World War. Haiti paid more than 27 billions. For becoming France. independent? Of course, because uh, it's as if the American slave, when they were freed, had to pay back the plantation owner uh, uh, for their freedom. And, and Haiti, of course, that topples the, the economy of Haiti for, for many uh, hundred years. 
And um, that's, uh, uh, that's why when people say, well, Haiti is a poor country, uh, that's also part of ignorance, because there is a history behind that. Haiti was not born poor. Haiti was providing more than one-third of French riches in the 19th century. That little island was providing one-third of French income. Uh, so, uh, and we were the victim. Uh, I mean, it's like the whole uh, Western uh, uh, powers punished Haiti for being Haiti. Mm. You know, to have the guts to become independent as a black country in a world where slavery was everywhere for the next hundred years. This was, this was unacceptable. And that's why they tried to silence Haiti for more than hundred years. And that continue until today. You know, because it's part of Haiti felt as part of, of the modern world, because we played a major role in the constitution of the modern world, even in the constitution of this country. You know, without Haiti, America would be two uh, uh, side of, uh, you know, two thirds of a country that he is today. You know, that's a fact. That, that's not because. speculation. Uh, because uh, of the, the fact that Haiti blocked France, one third of the UN, United States belong to France by treaty. You know, you, you've uh, heard of the uh, Louisiana Purchase. And Napoleon had to sell those territories because they thought they would establish slavery back in Haiti and continue to colonize the country they own per treaty. But they were blocked by the Haitian Revolution, and they lost. Uh, most soldiers died in Haiti. The head of the mission, uh, General Leclerc, died in Haiti. And so the French had to settle. And, uh, and the Americans just wanted to buy uh, the territories around New Orleans. And the French said, no, 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 you can have it all. You know, the whole uh, uh, one-third of the United States, from New Orleans to the lakes were sold for little money. So that changed the whole geopolitical of the world, you know, end of the story of this country. Raul Peck, I know um, you're going to have to leave soon because your film is just being released in the United States. But I wanted to end by asking you about the outrage in the United States at the um, conclusions the U.S. intelligence agencies have come to about the United States, um, about Russia interfering with the elections in the United States. And I wanted to turn this around. You have done a number of films, for example, um, Lumumba. Uh, uh, Death of a Prophet, uh, you have done sometimes in April. And I wanted to talk about what the U.S. has done in other countries in yeah. interfering with the leadership there, whether it was the in Iran, the overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953, moving right on to overthrowing the Guatemalan democratically elected government of our Benz in 1954. But you write about Lumumba. That is not yeah. talked about as much, at least here in this country, Patrice Lumumba. And what the U.N., you investigated the U.S. role and what happened there, the founding president of the Congo, of the Democratic yeah. Republic of Congo. Well, that's the irony of it all, you know, that, that uh, Donald Trump managed to make the CIA become the good guy in that story, you know. But unfortunately, we in the third world have a different take on the role that particularly the CIA had, you know, in the middle of the Cold War, uh, what they did in Congo, killing Lumumba, the first elected prime minister of Congo, somebody who just wanted a real independence without having the Belgian, the American and the French on his back. And they kill him for that. And you see today, 60 years later, Congo is still at war, you know, because they are still exploiting it, they're still having a puppet. And they are still supporting that puppet uh, on, on power because it allows them to still, you know, get the coltan, get the uranium, get, you know, Congo is a mineral. Coltan used in everyone's cell phones. Exactly. So it's the same story going on and again. Uh, if you see the whole story of Latin America, you know, how many dictatorships uh, were supported by American administration, uh, how many leaders were killed 
even in Washington, when we think about the Letelier at, at, uh, 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 killings in the middle of Washington, they put a bomb in his car. The Chilean diplomat the killed, plan. along with Ronnie Moffat, in 1976 exactly. on Embassy Row in Exactly. And in Washington. my own country, we had a dictatorship for 35 years. And who was the main supporter of that dictatorship? Of the Duvaliers. The of the Duvalier regime, the American uh, 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 administration. You know, when I was a student, you know, I, I studied in Germany, but my goal, like many of my uh, friends and colleagues, was to go back in Haiti and fight the dictatorship. And the generation before me, they did the same, and they were killed, because the CIA had told the Duvalier regime, you know, uh, beware, there is a group of young uh, people coming from Europe going to, you know, uh, do some sort of guerrilla in the country. So, and Duvalier used that all the time. You know, when he wanted more money from the United States, he just invented some sort of uh, a, a communist uh, assault against the country. So, we from the Third World tend to have a different view of the roles of the administration uh, in that sense. And yes. in the case of Lumumba, the film you did, Lumumba, The Death of a Prophet, for people who aren't familiar with who he was and what was the U.S. role that you could ascertain? Yeah, well, uh, Lumumba was part of the generation who wanted to get away from having to choose between uh, the U.S. and the Soviet. You know, they, they were trying to find a third uh, uh, place and get organized, and and that didn't go well. And Lumumba, who really wanted a, a real independence for his country, uh, was, you know, we know that Eisenhower allowed the CIA to work toward an assassination of Lumumba. Uh, he didn't work that way, and they used Mobutu to arrest him and send him to his enemy, Chambe, and he was executed in Katanga. And by the way, the killing of uh, Lumumba in front of the whole press, you know, the, the whole international press was filming his arrestation, uh, his arrest. And when he re they realized that he was killed, those were the beginning of the biggest demonstration worldwide. That uh, this were the demonstration before uh, uh, 1968, where there was the student revolt. But the first real demonstration, political demonstration of students all over the world was uh, after the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. I wanted to turn for a moment to a clip about the life and legacy of Patrice Lumumba, the first democratically elected leader of what's now the Democratic Republic of Congo, as Raoul was speaking about, the Congo being a colony of Belgium since the late 1800s, ruled over it with brutality while plundering its rich natural resources. Patrice Lumumba rising as a leader of Congo's independence movement in 1960, elected prime minister, Lumumba's pan-Africanism, his vision of a united Congo gained him many enemies both Belgium and the U.S. actively seeking uh, to have him overthrown or killed. Would you say the proof is in that the CIA ordered his assassination, Raoul? Oh, yes. One of the former CIA heads, uh, station head, wrote about it. But couldn't know? complete the job when they did couldn't it? Couldn't complete the job, because there were too many uh, conspirators. And, and one of them managed to do it with the help of Mobutu. But there were, uh, you know, there were examples of trying to use, by the way, as they tried to do with Castro, you know, to use some uh, his toothbrush, uh, to use some uh, poison, etc. Uh, there were many attempts, and that have been clearly documented by former CIA uh, 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 chiefs, station chief in in Congo. The United States and Belgium covertly funneled cash and aid to rival politicians who seized power, arrested Lumumba. This is how it was reported in a Universal Studios newsreel in December of 1960. A new chapter begins in the dark and tragic history of the Congo with the return to Leopoldville of deposed Premier Lumumba, following his capture by crack commandos of strongman Colonel Mobutu. Taken to Mobutu's headquarters, past a jeering, threatening crowd, Lumumba, Lumumba but promised the pro-red Lumumba a fair trial on charges of inciting the army to rebellion. Lumumba was removed to an army prison outside the capital, as his supporters in Stanleyville seized control of Oriental province and threatened a return of disorder. 
Before that, Lumumba suffered more indignities, including being forced to eat a speech which he restated his claim to be the Congo's rightful premier. Even in bonds, Lumumba remains a dangerous prisoner, storm center of savage loyalties and equally savage opposition. On January 17, 1961, after being beaten and tortured, Patrice Lumumba was shot and killed. And I wanted to go to the trailer of your film, um, Lumumba, The Death of a Prophet. When they belittle Lumumba, Lumumba is only a scapegoat. What they are attacking is the future of the Congo. So, from the Congo and Patrice Lumumba to sometimes in April, your film about Rwanda, where the U.S. chooses not to intervene or even trigger mechanisms of the U.N. to intervene by not calling what happened there in 1994 a genocide. Well, you know, that those are the two biggest uh, uh, um, legacy um, um, negative legacy that Bill Clinton left. One was Haiti, the second one was Rwanda, because the American could have prevented Rwanda. Everybody knew about uh, the massacre uh, which were coming. Uh, and, by the way, the, the murderers were not hiding. They were saying it every day on the radio. And uh, the U.N. stayed still, uh, the Americans stayed still, and even when the massacres started, uh, the the order of the administration it was, we will not intervene. This was sh a few months after Mogadishu, the, the totally disaster of American troops inside Mogadishu. So the decision for Bill Clinton was, we do not want to intervene. And they push it back and back until more than 800,000 people were killed and butchered. And, and so that's an important uh, uh, moment in, in the history of the whole continent and the history of this country. And making Sometimes in April was an important film uh, for me. And, and I, I made this film with the 1Ds. And uh, HBO, who was financing the film, uh, allowed me to have all the freedom I wanted to tell that particular story. And by the way, that was uh, Idris Elba's first film. And, uh, and they, uh, HBO accepted the fact that I wanted that the main characters uh, would be 1Ds. They should be the one telling their own stories. Hmm. Interesting that you also uh, brought in uh, black actors for the young Karl Marx. Yes, well, that, that was a, a very hard <laughs> uh, uh, reality, because, of course, uh, uh, in Europe, like here, uh, um, black characters are not the one you call first. So I had to fight with m some of the casting directors to make sure that uh, there are black people in this film, including, I, at one point, I had to put a costume myself uh, to, to play a character, because— When uh, you were a cameo? Uh, yes, in I the did young a cameo. Karl Marx. Yes, I, I did a quick cameo, because I, I wanted to have that image of— Because in the 19th uh, century, uh, you know, Haiti had diplomats everywhere. That's another thing people f uh, don't know, you know. So we had diplomats in, uh, in uh, Germany in the 19th century, in France. We had businessmen, merchants, in all those countries. Because Haiti was the only black independent nation in the whole world. And we had a convention with uh, uh, every country. Uh, Haiti is a, is a co-founder of the UN, you know. Uh, and at the time, it was the only country with Ethiopia to have that, that uh, position. Uh, it was a Haitian who, uh, you know, presided over the first human rights convention. He was. You know. So it's, it's, you know, we have a long uh, legacy and history in the, you know, uh, history of the world. And, and that is 
what we are trying to do today and to bring back this story. One of my projects is Toussaint Louverture, to really show to a wider audience what is the real story of that uh, nation. Toussaint Louverture, the um, freedom fighter of Haiti. Yeah, and, and the one that they called the Black Jacobin and who was the equivalent of a Black Napoleon. Um, I wanted to end with where you're headed next. Um, yes, your film, The Young Karl Marx, is just being released in the United States, but you're already working on your next. Uh, one of my next uh, projects uh, is a film about uh, Franz Fanon. Uh, I think uh, people here, um, academics might, might know him. He was a, a French uh, doctor from Martinique who basically revolutionized the way uh, um, um, how do you say, um, folly was treated. Uh, and he became involved in the Algerian war because he was a doctor in Algeria, sent by the French during the revolution, the Algerian revolution. And at one point, he decided to side with the revolutionaries and, and became a, an incredible uh, theorists wrote about uh, the, the need for uh, revolt and revolution. Uh, he You're saying is, a theorist, a Marxist uh, a, a theorist. Marxist theorist. But uh, uh, his specificity was about, uh, first of all, because he was a psychiatrist, uh, you know, he wrote about uh, the way, you know, he treated people who were under tortured, and he treated the people who were the tortured, and he wrote about that. And the writing of Fanon were used in all the liberation movement that came after, you know, the apartheid uh, uh, struggle, uh, Namibia, uh, part of Latin America as well. He was, you know, he's a, he's a man who died very early. He was 36. And he had written three books, and all those three books became classics, you know, one being uh, uh, the wretched of the earth. The wretched of the earth. The other one is black skin, uh, a white face. Those are classic that are uh, being taught in in American universities. So uh, and and I think this uh, this story needs to be known as well. So you're dramatizing because, the story. Yes, or? it's a it's going to be a narrative. But as all my film really based on reality, really uh, well researched, and you know I, I make film not because I I want to uh, tell stories. What I want to do is you know bring the real stories on on with real facts on the big screen. And so, and there, it's not a contradiction. People sometimes think because you do a biopic, you have to invent a lot of things that uh, were not totally true. I think it's the contrary. And, and I think in all my film, you could put at the beginning, this is a true story. And so how do you decide whether to do a documentary, as in the case with I Am Not Your Negro, and, uh, oh, a dramatic film like the young Karl Marx or your film? Well, like it, it depends on the moment and the content and, uh, and what I feel is more impactful uh, with the subject. And, and by the way, I often uh, end up doing both, you know, doing a documentary and a narrative. I did that for Lumumba. Uh, I did that for Fatal Assistance and Murder in Paco, because those are different sides of the same story. Uh, and, and for Baldwin, I may do a, a, a narrative uh, piece on, on Baldwin, because it's really uh, going totally immersed in a subject and make it uh, understood from different uh, aspect and point of view, and, and it make it stronger. So as we wrap up, and while you're here in the United States right now, um, you run uh, in Paris the FEMI. Can you explain what it is? Uh, La FEMI is the French National Film School. is uh, basically one of the three best film schools in the world. And I was nominated to be its president, uh, and I've been doing that for the last nine years. And it's it's a really it's an elite school, but we managed to make sure that people who would not have access to that school still can be uh, taken. Uh, it's very demanding. Uh, we have like 1,500 uh, applicants every year, but we only take 48. So it's a very uh, very specific uh, type of school, and you can learn everything from directing, producing, uh, writing. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, 
director of photography, sound, etc. And we, uh, three years ago, we opened the first uh, department ever in the whole world for writing for television series. So we, and we are quite proud of that. So finally, you're here to promote the young Karl Marx, and what do you hope people take away from that, especially in this time, in this era of Trump? Well, uh, you know, like for the Baldwin, uh, the, the, the main word for me is ignorance. And if uh, a young person can go and take a book after watching I Am Not Your Negro or watching the young Karl Marx, my job is done. It's really about know your history learn uh, where you come from, learn the history of your country, because that's the only way you can really fight, and you can really fight ignorance, because now you have all sorts of people coming in the media. Anybody can tweet uh, whatever he wants without being uh, having a response to respond for that. So uh, the only tools and, uh, and power you can have is to Take your own history in your own hands and read a few books. You don't need to do much, you know, and, and find a space for that, because we have little and little time every day, you know, you, between Twitter, Facebook and, and whatever you're watching on TV, uh, you, you have less and less time to really reflect about what's going on. You know, it's like, you know, you, you are searching for the next news, the next piece of discussion, and you are uh, uh, losing the bigger picture. And then they can just bring you anywhere they want, once you are just a puppet. And, and I believe in education. I believe that there is a fight against ignorance. Uh, the fact that today, somebody who spent 40 years of his life uh, experimenting, uh, learning about climate change, can be put at the same level than a president who said climate change is a hoax. You know, that's where we are. You know, how can we accept that, you know, to put at the same level an opinion which is not uh, uh, proven, which is not, which is just the, the idea of a man, and the work of researchers who have spent their whole life working on an issue. So against that, uh, it's, it's only books, learning from your teachers, learning from your elders, and, and I believe in that. And watching the film, The Young Karl Marx, yes, Raoul possible. Peck, acclaimed Haitian filmmaker, political activist, his new film, The Young Karl Marx, his documentary, I Am Not Your Negro, just won the BAFTA, the documentary prize at the British Academy Film Awards. Last year, it was nominated for an Oscar. Among his other films, Lumumba, Death of a Prophet, Haiti, The Silence of the Dogs, and Sometimes in April about Rwanda, uh, Raoul Peck. Um, briefly served as Haiti's culture minister in the 1990s. To see part one of our discussion, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.